Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today, we are talking about asking for help in law school and your job or internship. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking about asking for help in the right way. Um, And we're going to talk about asking for help both in school (laughs) and outside of school. So, Lee, why is this so important? Why do people need to ask for help? I mean, no one likes to ask for help generally, right? No, especially type A people really hate asking for help. But it is very important, especially at this point in your legal career, because you are learning something new. So you're going to need help. In fact, it is assumed that you're not going to know everything the first few times you do it, and that's okay. But people, whether they be professors or your supervisor at your new job, are not mind readers, and they cannot always identify when you're struggling. So, you know, you're seldom going to be penalized for asking for help, but you can be penalized for not asking for help and then having poor outcomes. That will typically drive either your professor or your boss crazy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, if you think about your professor, if you come in at the end of the semester or even like next semester after you get your grade and you want to argue your grade, you're like, well, I, you should have known that like I didn't know what I was doing and I wasn't understanding anything. They're going to be kind of like, why is that my problem? Like you never told me about that. You never came right. to office hours. You never asked for help. Like I'm sorry that you had that experience, but that's on you. Versus, you know, if you're going and asking for help early, professors are going to be really likely to help you because they aren't super busy. So if you're confused about a topic when you cover it, don't wait until reading week to go and talk with your professor about that topic. Go ahead and talk to them in the beginning of the semester and throughout the semester. You know, you should be going to office hours every couple of weeks, probably maybe sending an occasional email because the professors are more likely to help people who are consistently doing the work and getting those questions answered as they arise. So even, you know, if it's the same question, you might ask them at the beginning of the semester or the end of the semester, they're going to have more time and energy to help you towards the beginning, or particularly if you've been engaged the whole semester and they kind of understand your thought process and like what you know or don't know, all of those kind of things. Yeah. And I think academic support at your school, even TAs are the same. You know, if you roll in a week before the end of the semester and you're like, I'm panicked about my exams, they're going to be like, okay, I have one 30 minute meeting (laughs) because my meeting slots are all filled with students who I'm working with throughout the semester and I'm not going to be able to do much for you in 30 minutes. You know, and that might frustrate you, but that's just... Right, or you go to your TA. Right, you go to the TA, it's the same thing. TAs, it can be even worse because they're students studying for their own finals. So they don't have a lot of time at the end of the semester to help you either. Right, exactly. No, for sure. Like when I came, I was a TA and you know, by the end of the semester, you're like, okay, cool. Like, you know, here's, here's some, here's some stuff for you. I got to go study for my own exams. Like I can't handhold you at this point. It was the people who I actually had me built relationships throughout the semester and asked those questions early. They were the ones who got the benefit of my attention because I had more time then. Exactly. So I think it's helpful sometimes to play out what this sounds like. Um, So let's say you're in your contracts class and you have covered promissory estoppel and you're confused. So your first thought is to go to the professor. And then you might be thinking about how you should ask the professor for help. I would recommend not going to the professor and saying, I don't understand promissory estoppel, full stop. Because the professor has already taught you promissory estoppel once in class, or at least thinks they have. Now, maybe they did a bad job, totally possible, but they think they've already taught it once. So then they're like, Okay, you don't understand anything about promissory estoppel? Were you on the internet shopping for shoes? <laughs> Were you <laughs> chatting, texting? Were you not taking notes? Did you not read the cases? You know, you're really putting the onus on the prof to reteach the stuff they've already taught once. That doesn't make you look very good, and it's probably going to piss the 
cross off. Right. It's also just where do they even start? Like, I don't understand topic X. It's like, okay, you mean you don't know what those words mean? Like, what are we talking about here? <laughs> right. Exactly. So it is actually easy to frame it in a way that it's much you know, easier for the prof to want to help you. So before you go to the prof, you are scratching your head after class and you're like, I don't really understand promissory estoppel. So maybe you try and outline that section of the class and then you try and highlight like what part of promissory estoppel you don't understand. Maybe you have an examples and explanations and you do a small hypo on promissory estoppel, but you don't understand the outcome of the hypo. Well, that's also going to point you to the part of that law you don't understand. So you can then take your outline and the hypo to office hours and say, hey, professor, I've tried to outline promissory estoppel. Here's what I have. And I've also done this hypo on it and I don't understand this part of the outcome. I'm confused. Can we talk through it? And most professors will gleefully say... Of course, because you've already done the heavy lifting. They know that you've wrestled with the material. That's what they like to do. They like to help you solve the problems. I've had so many conversations with professors over the years where they're just like, I don't know why students won't come talk to me. <laughs> like, I don't know why they won't ask me these questions and wrestle with the material. I'm very bored in my office hours. But then they're all complaining they don't understand what's going on. Exactly. So you have to do some of the work if you're going to get the benefit of your professor helping you. Yeah. So I think the same idea applies to jobs, <laughs> except the stakes can often feel a little higher in a job. So whether it is an internship or an externship or your first job, um, it is important to think about when to ask for help. So I think when you're thinking about a job situation, the first opportunity to ask thoughtful questions is usually when you're getting an assignment. So what will feel very familiar to those of you that may have worked in a law office so far is you're going to be called in to talk to somebody or maybe in COVID times, you're talking to somebody on the phone, they're going to give you an assignment and you're hopefully going to have a legal pad where you're writing down your assignment and taking notes. And at that moment, you're going to want to ask as many clarifying questions as you can to make sure you fully understand the parameters of the assignment. I think that's a great idea. I mean, let's talk a little bit about what those clarifying questions might look like because you don't want to just be asking a whole bunch of random questions, but there are certain things that for almost any assignment you get in a law situation, you're going to need to know. So things like, you know, let me just clarify, like, which jurisdiction are we in? Are we looking for state cases? Are we looking for federal cases? And maybe you don't have to ask that directly, but you at least need to know, like, where are where is this case? Because there's nothing more frustrating, I will say, as a person who has given assignments to more junior people, where I give them an assignment and I tell them, you know, we're in federal court in New York or whatever, in the Southern District of New York, and then they come back with a bunch of state cases from New York, and I'm like, you just wasted your time, my time, and the client's time. Thank you for yeah. nothing. Go away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Also, I think sometimes when you're talking about subject matter, it's not just even the jurisdiction, but it could be about a case um, relating to something you've never heard of. So when I was a first year associate, I worked on some litigation around welding rods. And I can honestly say I had no idea what a welding rod was at all. During my first meeting, I still remember sitting in there and the guy and I mean, the I would, have, I would have no idea. Yeah, no idea. Right. So I would, and I remember like taking all these notes and then he he thoughtfully said, do you know what a welding rod is? And then I made some sort of like smart alecky comment about it, which he did not think was funny and then explained what a welding rod was. I was like, mm, <laughs> note, note to self, my humor not appreciated. <laughs> like, whoops. <laughs> Anywho, um. But, it's like, you know, no, actually, I'm just guessing you don't know what I'm talking about. So stop, right. <laughs> stop joking. Stop joking. Um, his time was very valuable. He didn't really want to listen to my humor. But if he hadn't have taken that time to explain to me what, what the case was about, it would have made my assignment a lot more difficult. So if you're litigating um, issues and even fact patterns that you just don't really know what's going on, you need to make sure you understand what the facts mean, what the terminology is, or you go look it up because 
really, I mean, welding rods could have sounded like a lot of things. And I will just tell everyone, in case you do welding rod litigation at some point, the welding rod is the thing that people melt when they weld things together. It is the thing. It's like when you see the bumpy stuff in the middle. I would not have guessed that necessarily. Yes. Yes. And so um, if you do not use adequate ventilation, there's some toxic stuff that comes out of that. And so um, it's very important to be safe when you are welding. Um, But that is what a welding rod was. Didn't know about that. (laughs) Didn't know. So um, it was important to really understand the facts of what we were talking about. Yeah, I had a case once on like voltage regulators on chips. Hmm, Not something I knew much about at the time, but I learned a lot about it. So, you know, you're going to get thrown into these situations where there's no reason that you would know what a welding rod is or I would know anything about voltage regulators. And someone who, you know, someone who is good at giving assignments will hopefully give you enough context that you have some idea of what's going on. But if not, it's absolutely fair to say, hey, you know, could you just give me like the two minute big picture on what this case is about? Mm-hmm. Um, and they may not think, you know, they may just assume because they're so like steeped in this case that they maybe have been working on for years that like, of course, it's obvious what all this is about. But I think just having that context of like, all right, so basically, you know, here's who we're representing. Here's what they've been accused of doing. And here's why we think they're, you know, not guilty or whatever mm-hmm. um, or not liable. Hopefully, um, unless you're in criminal court. Um, but, you know, basically just even that brief overview so you have context. And like, okay, and let me just clarify, we're in the Southern District. So, okay, great. We need federal cases. All right, cool. Um, you know, sometimes you can ask about who these people are briefly and how they fit into it. Say that you've mm-hmm. been, you know, one of the things people might be asked to do as young lawyers is stuff like reading depositions or summarizing depositions or all those type of things. It's like, who are these people? How do they fit in? Um, right. Just a f- little bit of background can help a lot. Yeah. And then it's really important that you understand kind of the objective of the assignment. You know, is this something quick and dirty or is this something that could eventually get filed somewhere? Is this part of a right. brief? Is this background research? You know, when uh, when the welding rod litigation went to trial, I was part of the like in office trial team. So I was basically told to sit at my desk <laughs> and wait for emails, which is basically what my job was. And then there were a few of us and they would just- (laughs) Basically, we need you to research this immediately. Immediately, it would be like, we have an, we are in a recess for an hour for lunch and I need an answer by the end of lunch. And then all of us would research and then write a paragraph and email back to the trial team. And, you know, that like part, I was part of my understanding was it didn't need to be like my research needed to be perfect, but it just needed to be clear, concise, answer the question, drop it in an email, send it off. No, ex- no blue book checking, <laughs> like nothing like that, right? Like cite to the case, send it off. And, you know, that's very different than you are researching, you know, an objective memo so they can write a client letter later. You know, it's just, it's very important to understand what the output is because that's also going to involve how much time you're likely allowed to spend on an assignment and how much time you spend on something, especially if it's billable, is very important. Right. I think the timing aspect is so critical. I mean, in the example you gave, if you gave the most perfect answer in the world, but you gave it four hours later, it wasn't really useful by the end of that lunch break. So understanding what you're trying to do is super critical. Um, You know, I think another key piece is really understanding how you can get help if you need help later. So who can help you and are there resources you can use? So for example, if you're a very young lawyer, um, you may not know about horn books. And I remember when I was working as a 1L, someone gave me one of those quick and dirty assignments. They needed an answer in like an hour. And I guess I had like the deer in the headlights look looking at him when he was telling me this. And he sort of said at one point, you do know about Corbin on contracts. And I kind of looked at him blankly and he's just like, oh, they don't teach you anything in law school. <laughs> like, let me take you and show you this book. And like literally he took me to the library and showed me this book. And he's like, all the answers are in this book. Just pull it from the library shelf. And like the answer I'm asking you will be in there. Find it and send it back to me in the next hour. And I was like, what, they just tell you the answers? He's like, yeah, yeah this, this is how lawyers actually do work. Um, you know, and I think, I mean, we've never learned about that. They don't want you to know that the answers are just right there. Um, but the reality is for literally basically every legal topic, there is a horn book. So, you know, when it was like Prosser on torts. It's, uh, I forgot the guy who's on patents, but you know, there's like the patent guy. 
Yeah, and criminal. There's a criminal use these things, one. and there will yeah. be a resource like that. So, oftentimes, too, in your firm, depending on how big the firm is or how big the team is, it there may be individuals who are kind of designated to help you. So, you might be able to have a mentor that you follow up with, or even some firms have law librarians. Sometimes even your um, administrative assistant or the paralegals might be able to point you in a direction because they've done a lot of work over the years on different assignments and teams. But doing a little legwork on your own to try and solve some of your own problems or get your own questions answered is a good thing. The other thing that you want to think about is, have I been given the answer to this question already? So, you know, you're new, you they've You probably went to some trainings. You were giving training materials. It is possible that the answer is already at your fingertips. You just have to go look for it. So before you go, start asking folks to step away from their billable work to answer your questions. Make sure you review any information that's been given to you. Do they have templates? Do they have directions of where to find things on like a shared drive? You know, whatever it might be, there may already be some clues of where you can go find things. It doesn't look great to complain about not knowing something when you attended a training on it. That's not a great, that's not a great look. Yeah. No, that's definitely true. And I think people get very upset when they have carefully prepared things for you and tried to give you training materials. And then it's clear that you haven't read them or haven't paid attention to them or haven't internalized them because people actually worked on this. So I think it's one thing to say, hey, you know, I remember in that training, we talked about this thing and I can't remember exactly how I access it. Could you help me access that? That's a, that's a fine question. To go right. in and say, we never learned anything about you know recording our time. It's probably not true. You probably <laughs> right. did. And you probably should have some sort of documentation on that. And you probably should try to find it. And again, it's just a lot of it's in the way you phrase it. So, you know, I know that I need to be recording my time. And I know we did a training on this. For some reason, I've just totally spaced on it. Like, can you send me a resource to help me get in the right direction? That's a different question than I don't know what to do with my time. Or even better, my friend who's a recruiter once had summer associate come in and basically drop their like expense report on her desk and be like, oh, these are my expenses. And she's like, great. What do you want me to do about it? (laughs) We gave you stuff like this is not my problem. Right. You know, and also like, why would I like what? Why would I deal with your expenses? Like this is not something I deal with. So, you know, kind of understanding who's in charge of things and what people can help you with, I think is really a critical skill set so that you don't make everyone really annoyed with you. I think the timekeeping is also great. You know, time is due at the end of the month. And if you aren't sure how to track your time, don't talk to somebody on the 31st of the month. Well, you should be doing that all along too. I mean, people, people get very, you know, persnickety about that too well i know but if you aren't sure you're doing it right you got to talk to somebody Go i was just gonna say i think that's one of those things that law firms particularly but really any legal employer gets pretty persnickety about because time is money and the sooner people internalize that the better and timekeeping is one of those things that like people will get upset about you know so i think sometimes people think things like timekeeping don't really matter but that is one of those things you want to ask your questions on early and make sure you know what you're doing and you want to you know maybe like a secretary or someone who's been assigned to you can help you with that um because that's one of those things that like a partner you're working for will actually get upset about and that's not a position you want to be in for getting yelled at over something silly that you easily could have corrected yeah so one of my own personal pet peeves that i'll just share is waiting until the end of a project or a process to ask for help. I don't like fire drills that aren't true fire Mm, drills. Yeah. And the thing is, when I worked for other people, fire drills used to drive me crazy when they were avoidable, (laughs) because I think there are plenty of fire drills that are unavoidable. But um, so when people work for me, or if I'm on a team with folks, I want to know about a problem as soon as it arises so it doesn't become a fire drill. And I think that this is something that a lot of type A right. like perfectionists struggle with because it seems like a failure to go to a supervisor or go to a team member and say, I'm struggling, I've tried and I'm struggling, but I actually am gonna get much more frustrated if you are struggling and things are going poorly and then it ends up making more work in the end for somebody else. Right, because that's when like a real disaster happens. 
And also, yeah. I think it can make you, I don't want to say clairvoyant looking, but at least make you look like you're paying attention to say, hey, you know, I'm starting to notice that there could be a problem arising and I wanted to get your take on what to do with it versus, oh, I'm seeing a problem and I'm not doing anything about it because I hope the problem will go away and resolve itself. And now it's two weeks later and is ballooned into a giant problem because no one dealt with it and no one knew to deal with it because I didn't say anything. That's just yeah. not a great look because now you have, you know, the conflagration of the fire drill, not just like the tiny little one that you could have sprayed out. Yeah. And even sometimes you don't even, you know, you could be angsty and stressed about the fact that things are difficult, but it's not as big of a deal. And it's your anxiety around it is making it so much worse. So I remember my first summer I worked for the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Criminal Division. And this attorney gave me an assignment and I couldn't find any answer. Like it was like I was digging, I was reading, I was like there was no answer. And after a day or two before the assignment was due, I went to the attorney and popped my head in and said, do you have a minute to talk to me about this assignment? And she was like, sure. And I said, OK, so I mean, I'll be honest, I don't think there's a direct answer to your question. I found all of this stuff and I just kind of gave a Cliff Notes version. And she's like, yeah, I didn't think there was an answer. <laughs> she's like, that's why I just wanted you to like see if there was one. And I was like, oh, OK. But, in, but I was really upset because I thought I was failing because I couldn't find the answer where I didn't really understand that I was just kind of doing kind of this digging assignment um, for fun and trying to see if there was an answer when she didn't think there was one. And so by talking to her, I kind of reevaluated what I was doing and then was able to, you know, abandon work that wasn't going anywhere. But she didn't get upset at me because my non-answer was actually an OK answer. Yeah, I had an exactly similar situation when I was working after my 1L summer where they gave me a similar thing, which is a complete wild goose chase. And I chased it down for days and I was like banging my head against the wall. And finally, I went back to the person who gave it to me. I was like, I really just, I, I cannot find anything on this. And he's like, yeah, that's pretty much what I expected. Like the partner keeps telling me there should be something, but I didn't really think there was and I didn't <laughs> want to spend time on it. So yeah, thanks. I know. And I realized <laughs> that that's the kind of assignment that sometimes they give to summer associates. Yep. So true. So I think the last piece of this part of asking for help, whether it be to a mentor, to even a law librarian, or to your supervisor, is to think about the way that you're framing your struggles. I think that, you know, as we said before, you want to make sure that you've done some legwork so you've attempted to answer your own question. And I think when you go to a supervisor and say, you know, I have, I'm having some struggles. I think it's important to say, here's what I've done. You know, I've done X, Y, Z, and I'm still struggling with ABC. And I hope that you could help me with like EFG. Because that's just like when we were talking about with the professors, that's going to show that you've done some legwork and heavy lifting. You've tried to solve the problem yourself. And then you're asking for their assistance in a very specific way. That makes you look great, to be honest. <laughs> like everyone's like, I'm so glad you came. You know, your response is going to likely be like, <laughs> I'm glad you came to me. Let's work on solving this issue so we can keep you moving forward. But the flip side is sometimes folks will come to a supervisor and say, I'm struggling with ABC because you didn't give me what I needed. And that's not going to go over well. No, it's not. <laughs> It's not, especially if they have given you what you needed, but you just didn't realize it because maybe you just jumped to the conclusion that you didn't have what you needed. And that's just not going to come out well, even to be honest, if they didn't give you what you needed, you still don't want to frame it that way because it's just going to make people angry and defensive. Yeah, which is generally not what you want to do. Um yeah, and I think, you know, like we said, you probably do have a lot of resources. You see this a lot with like citations and things like that, where you're just like, you know what, you have like people you can call for this. Like, do you not remember that you have your Westlaw rep or what? I'm like, I'm sure that they've given it to you on like 18 different cards. Just call <laughs> yeah. those people and like let them solve your problem. That's what they do. <laughs> yeah. So it's really a lot about 
doing some heavy lifting on your own, but also think about how you're framing your problems for your supervisor. I mean, I have really never gotten frustrated with anyone who's worked for me by them just being green and needing support and coming to me for support. That is not like, I like to do that. I like mentoring and training people. That's one of the reasons I own a company where I manage other people <laughs> like that. But I don't like unnecessary fire drills. Um, and I don't I don't really like, um, and I don't like people to recognize what they've already had kind of from me. And this, this happened when I was working too. Like I didn't like it when summer associates acted like, you know, my assignment was bad or that like I was the reason they couldn't finish it on time or whatever. That's not my problem. Um, and so you really just want to think about how you frame these conversations with your supervisors so it can be productive and just make sure that you're not throwing up your hands and saying like, well, I just don't have what I need to be successful and that's on you. Because even if that's true, it's not going to look great on your annual review. Right. I mean, nobody likes a whiner, basically. Yeah. So if you come and say, you know, even let's say you don't have what you need, totally possible, but you enter the meeting with, I have done all of these things and I can't find what I need, then also the supervisor doesn't have to say, well, did you do this, this, and this, and this? You know, <laughs> like it shows them that you've hustled. And I think once somebody knows that you've put in the work, everybody's going to be a lot more, um, just a lot more available to give you help. And that's what we were talking about going back to the professors. It's important to basically show the professor that you've done some heavy lifting, that, you know, you've done the work and they're going to want to help you. And the job is just not that different. So it's important to frame these conversations before you go have them, even if they're over email. So you can um, just go in with, you know, your plan of what you're going to say and how you're going to ask for help. And it's m really likely it's going to go a lot better. True. I mean, I would even ask people to send me their search queries if they told me they couldn't find things. And I'm like, and if they couldn't do that, then I'm like, what have you been doing? Yeah, <laughs> you know? it's true. Like, I need to see what you actually did to help you. Yeah. I mean, most supervisors do not expect you to be perfect in the beginning. Hopefully all supervisors. But in the beginning of your career, you're going to need help. Just make sure that you're do asking for help in a constructive way and that you're not creating fire drills. And for other busy lawyers, you just want to make sure that you can go to them and say, hey, I need some help. When do you have the opportunity to help me? And then most good supervisors or mentors are going to sit down and set aside some time to help you. But just remember to be respectful of everybody's time and to try and solve your own problems when possible. And then when you go with the real problems that you need help with, then everybody's going to be really ready to help you. Definitely. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon. Mm -hmm.